Hi everybody, this is Stephen Pugh. We're going to be do, we're going to be taking another video, video number six, on the uh, City and Girls course for carpentry and joinery. So this is video number six, and we're going to be taking a look at what's called technical information. This is under Unit 202, Principles of Building Construction, Information and Communication. So let's go for it. And um, we're not actually going to be reading it specifically, but we're going to be going through the book. The actual technical book and we'll be talking about it together so we begin at the very beginning that technical information now technical information um, is all about um, how we receive the information that we're going to need to be able to build something correctly now we could be building in lots of different ways it could be a building it could be an apartment block it could be building bridges it could be anything to do with carpentry and joinery and in fact anything to do with um, construction and in, 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 in any of the other trades but specifically this is a carpentry and joinery course so this section then is going to discuss three main sources of technical information you've got working drawings and specifications you've got schedules and you've got bill of quantities so we'll talk first of all about drawing scales now the most important thing we need to remember about drawing a scale is that um, it's 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 almost impossible for 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 builders to be able to have drawings that are exactly the same size as the piece that's being made so for example if you wanted to draw um if you wanted to build a cabinet then you, it's, it's no good getting a piece of paper the same size as the cabinet uh, because it would be a massive piece of paper and imagine if it was a massive piece of paper in in terms of the size of a house or the size of a block of flats you know this is now impractical so what happens is we use scale now a scale is a very simple thing um, 1.2 is a scale of 1.2 you see that now in the scale of 1.2 if you can imagine we knock away the the dots and what we end up with is um, something that looks a little bit like that. Now we're all familiar with that, that's a half, okay? So in other words, the drawing that's on the page is half of the size of the original object. Very simple, really. Imagine if the drawing was like this, okay? A scale of one to 10. Now in a scale of one to 10, this scale is going to be the way in which quite a large object is represented on a sheet of paper. Now, that means that it's going to be the drawing that's on the piece of paper is one tenth, one tenth of the size of the original thing. So whatever the object is, say it was a cupboard or say it was something quite large, the, the drawing is one tenth of the size. So whenever you measure something on the drawing, you just have to multiply it by 10 and you'll end up knowing what the original size is. Now, of course, a lot of drawings are actually quite big. You might have a one to 500, okay? Now, a one to 500 means that it's just 500 times smaller than the original object. The, the, say, for example, it was a building. The, the picture that's depicted on the plan is 500 times smaller than actually what the, um, what the original object is. So this is a very simple way of being able to draw really large things on a small sheet of paper. So that's scales. Scales are a very, very simple thing. They're not at all complicated. And um, what, what happens is, that uh, some clever person has come along with the idea of having a scale rule. So this is an ordinary ruler. However, when you look at the numbers on the rule, you'll discover that the numbers are not like an ordinary ruler, okay? The numbers on a scale rule are deliberately made so that whenever you measure according to what it says, if it says one meter, on a one to five, it means that that measurement is going to be um, one fifth of what the original meter was. Now this is much easier um, than, much easier practiced than something that is talked about. But there we are, drawings all come in different sizes um, and they all come in different scales. And this is a universal thing. 
all drawings are done like this. The next thing we need to understand is a thing called date and points. Now, sometimes if you're wandering around the countryside, you'll see on a farm gate or you'll see on a church building um, a special mark. And it's a line with um, an arrow underneath. Let me draw it for you so you can see what I have in mind. It's something that looks a little bit like this. Okay, you'll see that marked on a building. And what that means is that that particular line there, and it may have a number next to it, it may say, it may say 300 meters. If it says 300 meters, this means that that particular mark has been marked from sea level as being exactly 300 meters above sea level. Now, this is a great thing because what this means is that when you're working on a building, it's possible to um, it's possible to know exactly how high that building ought to be. And that's how we use, uh, this is called an ordnance survey benchmark. Now the word ordnance there is referring to ammunition. So this was all done originally by the civil engineers and by the um, the engineers of the army and their job was to be able to map out the battlefield so they could figure out um, how to shoot their cannons or how to shoot their rifles so the 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 the, 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 the countryside was very very carefully mapped out not only so that you could see from above on a bird's eye view but also it was worked out according to its height above sea level and that means that on a map you'll see little dots and it'll say how many meters above sea level that is. And that's exceptionally useful if you're in the army and you want to be able to read the ground. So it's called Ordnance Survey Benchmark, or OBM, Ordnance Survey Benchmark, and it's the height given above sea level. Occasionally, when we're on a building site, it isn't necessary to actually go and find the original benchmark and track it all the way back to the building. So what a surveyor will do is he will put a peg in the ground and seal it with concrete and he'll say, right, we're going to start from that temporary benchmark. It's a TBM, a temporary benchmark, and all of the height measurements on the site are going to be taken from that mark. So there we are. You've got an ordnance benchmark and a temporary benchmark. And those two, these, these are just facts that people need to know about if they're going into the building industry. Now, when we're drawing plans, not everything on the plan needs to have a little label telling you what it is. So, for example, if you are drawing a house and you wanted to draw the sink in place, you don't need to have a little line coming off it saying this is a sink. And you don't need to have a little line coming off it saying this is a wash hand basin. And you don't need another sign saying this is the bath. What happens is that architects and architectural technicians, when they're doing their draftsmanship work and they're drawing plans, they will use a particular way of drawing something which everybody understands. So it doesn't need to have a label. Let me give you a list of some of the things that they do. For example, uh, a WC is always drawn in exactly the same way. A window is always drawn in exactly the same way. A door is always drawn in the same way. With a door, it shows the door open and then it shows a line coming across. I think I'm going to have to use my whiteboard more than I realise. Let's look at some of these. So a door then is simply an opening between a wall. Okay, there's the opening between the wall. Okay, and the door stands open, but there is a there is a little line coming, a little circular line coming across it. And that little circular line shows that this is a doorway. And these conventions, these ways of drawing things are universal. Everybody does it in exactly the same way. Now that there, strange as it may appear, is describing a window. But in this particular case, where the arrow points upward is it's pointing towards the uh, place where the hinges are. So this particular one is hung at the top and if I had it round that way round it would then be hung at this side on here. Okay so all of the different types of um, hatchings they're called on drawings are similar and of course if you turn to your book and turn to page 48 of the uh, City and Guild's 
level two book, you'll see a whole raft of hatchings. There's hatchings for brickwork. So that when you're looking at the plan, it doesn't have to say that it's brickwork because we all know exactly what that means. There's um, hatchings for timber that's softwood. There's hatchings for timber that's hardwood. There's hatchings for timber that's not been planed. And there's hatchings for timber that has. There's, there's special little uh, indications for concrete. Okay. There's an indication for subsoil. There's an indication for stonework. Now, all of these ways of drawing are universally used. So you can pick up a plan in the site office and look at it. And the hatchings, the details of the building will be identical to everybody else. This is like a little unique language all by itself. Now, when you do pick up these drawings, you're going to discover there's lots of different types of drawings. For example, there's the type of drawing that is a block plan. Now, a block plan is a drawing really of generally the street, the whole street in which the house is located. And it'll show all the other houses around. It'll show the pavement. It'll show you the names of the street. It'll also give you an indication which way round is north. That's good. But in the centre of the drawing, there will be a shaded building all filled in with ink. That is called a block plan. And what it's showing you, it's showing you which house you're going to actually work on. It would be really bad, wouldn't it, if you went to a site and you started working on the wrong house. <laughs> that would be absolutely crazy. So a block plan then is a plan that tells you which house you're working on. Now, there are other types of plans. Let's go through some of them. There's the site plan. Now, a site plan is a picture of a whole site. So it includes an aerial view of the house or the building you're working on. Included in that will be the street next door. It will also record things like um, drainage pipes. It will record where there's hedges or where there's trees. In other words, it's an overall picture of just the site itself. It will even tell you where the, um, where the fence is that goes around the site to keep it safe, to keep it secure. So that's a site plan. Uh, the people that draw up these plans are not necessarily the architects. The architects are the people who dream up the ideas and speak to the client and, and, and design the whole building. But the people that do the actual drawing are usually called architectural technicians. Okay. Now there's another type of plan called a floor plan. A floor plan is like taking a house and cutting it across uh, with a knife and taking the roof off and looking down from above and as you look down from above you're going to be able to see all the walls both on the outside and on the inside you're going to be able to see the kitchen unit set out you're going to see everything for each floor of the building so if it's a two-story building then you'll be able to look down upon the building and see everything on the ground floor Okay, if it's a two story building, you'll be able to see everything in all the bedrooms and the upper floor. Okay, you'll even be able to see the staircase going up on the ground floor and you'll see it actually going down from the second floor. So that's what a floor plan is. An elevation plan is actually another type of drawing where you look at the front of the building and you see the front of the building and the windows and, and the chimney and everything else just as if you were walking down the street and you took a picture of it. So you will see the front of the building, you'll see the side of the building, you might see the other side of the building, and you might occasionally see a picture as if it's from above. Now this doesn't tell you anything about how the building is constructed. What it tells you is what the building will look like, generally speaking. So that's the point. Now there's another type of plan called a section plan. This is what happens is if you take the building and you cut it right there way down with a knife and open it out like you would on a child's um, playhouse. As you open the building up, you then can see the floors and you can see the furniture inside and you can see the staircase. And you can see as if you're looking straight in front of the. You take off the front wall and you look straight inside the building. That's called a sectional plan. But there's other types of drawings as well. There's one that's called a constructional detail drawing 
or a detail drawing, whichever, whichever phrase you want to use. And what this will do, this will show you from the architect exactly how particular parts of the building meet up, how they meet up and what devices are there to keep them together and the building going up beyond. And on this particular plan, very often there'd be lots of little words explaining what all the different parts are that fit together. So it enables the joiner to be able to understand how things are assembled, how things are constructed. That's why it's called a constructional drawing. Okay, now there's other types of drawings, but those are the main ones. Let's look at let's look at a few items of paperwork that are necessary on a construction project. The first thing is, is permits to work. It's not possible, you know, to just walk onto a building site and start doing stuff without permission. A lot of work you don't need permission from because the boss just tells you what to do. But when it's specific things, for example, if you're working down inside a tunnel, if you're working in, in a dangerous position, if you're working with hot materials like a blowtorch, or if you're working with certain types of specialized tools, you would need to have what's called a permit to work. And these permits to work are very, very important because um, it's, it's lots of accidents occur, especially hot accidents, things like fires occur on buildings when somebody's there and they're not specifically controlled enough. So they tend to set things ablaze or do something very silly like that. And of course, what this needs is a certain amount of control by the building supervisor to make sure that everybody understands exactly what they're supposed to be doing. There are other other things that are important on a site, for example, signs and notices. You may have a sign telling you where to assemble if there's a fire drill or if there's an actually a fire. There may be signs telling you about certain dangers. There may be notices put up from the building company or from the local authority saying what is allowed to be done at this particular property or what's proposed to be done. These are all signs and notices that we need to really know about and read. One of the other very important pieces of um, information on a building site um, that you'll come into contact with quite a bit is called the specification. Now the specification is usually a fairly large book, uh, probably about anything from, from 10 to 100 or 200 pages. What the specification does is it specifies the details of the building work that isn't just written on the plan. Sometimes the specification is part of the plan, but in the main it's in a book. And it will specify, for example, the type or the colour of the paint that's going to be used in certain places. It will also tell you what particular type of wood that you should be using. It will also tell you on the specification what type of bricks, what colour they should be, what number they should be. It will also tell you on the specification what sort of plaster is to be used and where it's to be used. So this is quite a detailed drawing, quite a detailed um, writing by the way. And, and this writing specifies It'll say there'll be a door handle, but it'll be this colour and it'll be this type and it'll be this number. And so as a carpenter, you need to be able to read the specification to make sure that you put the right door handle on the door. See the point? See how important this, this thing is. Another type, another piece of information that you might come across is called a component range drawings. Very often when you go to buy, say, windows or doors or even locks and fittings, you'll discover that they've got a brochure. And that brochure will have lots of pictures in it, just line drawings, but they're pictures. And those pictures will give you um, a visual drawing of the different range of things that are able to be made or able to be supplied. So, for example, if you went to a window manufacturer, you would have a drawing of all the different types of windows and what they look like visually. Another thing that you'll come in contact with, and carpenters come into contact with this very, very regularly, it's a very regular thing, is a thing called schedules. Now, a schedule is used to record a repeated design information. So, for example, when you're looking at the main plan, you'll see all the doorways on the plan. And you'll notice it'll say door number six, door number seven, door number eight, door number 22, door number 24. 
What you then will have is you will have what they call a master door schedule. And that is just a matrix, a grid. And on that grid, if you look at it carefully, it'll say door number four, door number six, door number 10, door number 25. And when you look at what it says about door number six, it will say, it'll give you the size of the door. It'll give you the standard width height. It'll tell you the type of lintel that should be above that doorway. It'll tell you whether the door is supposed to be self-closing. It'll tell you what position that door is going to be on. It'll tell you which way round it's going to be hung, because it could be hung on the right or the left. It could be opening inwards or outwards. So this is how you know um, the details of that door. And if it's a really good um, uh, door schedule, it'll tell you what type of door it is, It'll tell you what type of handles you're going to put on, what type of lock is going to be there, whether there's going to be a push bar, whether there's going to be a panic bar. All these details are put on that door schedule. So there's no excuse. You have to make sure that you put the right locks and the right fittings on the right door. Very simple thing. So this is, this is all the information. This is all the details that as a carpenter you need to become familiar with. I recommend that you get a load of plans, go to a site office, get all the plans out and start looking at them. Looking at the plans, looking at the details on those plans is actually your bread and butter. You need to be able to understand all the hatchings. You need to be able to understand what all the little symbols mean. Very often you see, they'll draw a plan and they won't tell you what things mean. If it draws a little box, a little D shape next to it, that's going to be a toilet. And nobody needs to tell you, um, nobody needs to tell you um, that that's a toilet because it's a universal design for that particular uh, description. So I'm hoping that this is helpful. Now, don't forget, every video is going to be followed by 12 questions. Those 12 questions will enable you to rethink some of these things. What you might like to do after, after having seen those questions is to just go through the video again and stop it and start it. And just you can use this video for yourself as many times as you like. You can play it 10 times if you like. Each time you play it, you'll learn something else again. So don't forget, this is the nitty gritty of um, the principles of building construction information and communication. And we look forward to seeing you on the next video. Have a great day. Bye for now.